welcome. We're in the book of Galatians. If you have your Bibles with you or your phones or iPads, chapter 4, verse 21. Are you ready? This gets fun right in here. This is the fun part. Let's see how, uh, how it hits you. By the way, as we go through this, if you have a question that pops up or you're not understanding something, there's microphones, holler, raise your hand. I can only see about after the third or fourth row, so you have to really kind of shake and yell and scream. Um, but get your, if, you're, if you're wondering about it, somebody else probably is too, and we'll try to answer as much as what the Word says. And if, um, if you just have a, a great insight, that'd be fine too, okay? Are you happy? All right. Anybody, were you cold today at all? Whew, man, ah, that wind. It's warm in here, though, warm in the Word of God. So here we go, verse 21 of chapter 4. Tell me, who you want, tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, the other by a free woman, his son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born in the result of a promise. Stop right there. What in the world is he talking about? Anybody have a clue? What in the world is he talking about? What's he referring to? Who is he referring to? Over here? You have the microphone with you? All right, just need to turn it on. Okay. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, God told Abraham that Sarah would bear him um, a child, and even though he didn't quite believe it at the beginning, um, she, she did, but in the meantime, trying to do his, uh, uh, she tried to, and she was the free woman, and her, I don't know if you called her a handmaiden, or I guess a, a slave, but she convinced her husband to go in and lie with her. Uh, her as well, so that he didn't quite believe God's promise. And um, I think that's what the difference is. Okay, great. Thank you. Sarah and the handmaid is named what? Hagar. Hagar the horrible? No, that's different. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to add to that? So, so what, what, is your, what is your knowledge of Sarah and Hagar? I, it, do you, do you know a lot about that story or a little bit about that story or part of that story? Do you want to look at that story a little bit or is that like, uh, that sounds like a lot of history and kind of boring? How many would like to look at that story a little closer? Uh, I'll take, I see, I see a hand, that's enough. Go back to Genesis, if you will, Genesis. And, and let me just say, as we're doing, I think it's the 16th chapter of Genesis. As you're turning there, Here's what you got to remember. As, as the, what Paul calls them the Judaizers, those who were Jewish Christians, they had a Jewish background, became Christian, and, um, and they were trying to drag into the, into the belief system um, that it's Jesus, we believe in Jesus as Messiah, but let's throw on a little bit of our, of our Jewish tradition, mainly circumcision and some of the ceremonies. And, um, and they're pretty proud of their Jewish lineage, their heritage. They were quite proud of it. That whole third chapter, they're talking about it all the time. They're so proud of it that they recognize that they went all the way back to the promises of Abraham when God gave Abraham the promises so that when you became a believer, if you were a Gentile, which now Paul was going to all the Gentile regions, the, the Greeks, the Romans, that when he's like, come on, you're, you're welcome, but if you really want it, I mean, if you really, really want it, Here's what we'd like you to do. If you'll do a couple of just little easy things and become Jewish, then your lineage goes, joins us all the way back to Abraham. And you are really connected because then you got Jesus, you got Abraham, you're part of the chosen people. And if you haven't got the message by now, Paul kind of revolts against that over and over and over again. He just keeps, keeps laying it on us. You probably got that message already. But they go back again. They're proud of their heritage, they're proud of their lineage, and they want every believer to, to become like them. So 
Paul deals with it and he just says, hey, you know what, you guys who wanna be under the law, do you even know what the law says? Do you recognize the ramifications of that? Let me go on to your territory. Chapter 16 of Genesis. We'll just, I'll just kind of I'll read, read along with me as I, as I go through the, the, the account of Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Does that sound a little strange to any of you women out there? Men are going, yeah, that's probably the way it ought to be, but the, I mean, that's, Abraham agreed to what Sarah, Sarai said. It doesn't even say anything about reluctantly. Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abraham, Abraham had been living in, in Canaan for 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived and when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think's best. And then Sarai mistreated Hagar. So Hagar fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert, and it was a spring that is beside the road of Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. And then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress, submit to her. And the angel added, I will increase your descendants that, that they will be too numerous to count. Gives a great promise to her. The angel also said, you're now with child, you will have a son, you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Any of you would like to hear a prophecy by an angel about your child? He's gonna be a wild donkey of a man. Everybody's gonna hate him. Look over in verse 15 of that chapter. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old, and when Hagar bore, eight, was 86 years old when, when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Poor Abram, you know, he, his name means like father of, of nations. It's coming off this promise and everything. And he, you can imagine when he goes in the grocery store and he has this little credit card, his little debit card, and it says, father of many nations, and they, they look at it and they go, your, your name, father of many nations? Yeah. How many kids you have? None. Well, but I'm going to get ready to get started. Well, how old are you? I'm like in my 80s. Okay, here, next. You know, I mean, poor, so he's, he's, he needs, he needs a, <laughs> some help in it, and Sarai helps him. Look at verse 1 of chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, now after Hagar had given him Ishmael at 86, at 99, the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm the Lord God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between you and me. It will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down. God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You'll no longer be the father of many nations. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have had many, made many your, you a father of many nations. I've made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Quite, quite a beautiful promise. Verse 15 of that chapter, God said to Abram, as for Sarai, your wife, you're no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of many of, of nations, king of peoples come from her. Abraham fell, Abraham fell face down. He laughed, said to himself, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? 
And Abraham said to, to God, if, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. God, we already got one here. You know, can you just, can you just bless him? And verse 19, God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will also bear you a son. You'll call him Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. I, I'll bless him. I'll make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He'll be the father of 12 rulers, and I'll make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. And when he finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. Turn over to chapter 21 real quick. Now the Lord, verse one, was gracious to Sarah, as he said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant, bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At that very time, God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. And when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. They, um, they have this big, this big feast. Um, Sarah saw, Sarah saw that the, the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I'll make the son of a maidservant into a nation also because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and skin water, gave them to Hagar, set them on their shoulders, and sent her off with the boy. And she went off on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. And when the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under, the, under one of the bushes, and she said, as she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. And God heard, her, heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said, what's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up, take him in your hand, I'll make him into a great nation. And God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and so she went and filled the water and gave the boy a drink. And uh, the, God was with the boy and he grew up and he lived in the desert and became an archer. And she found him a wife from Egypt. And the rest is history. <laughs> Okay, you kind of kept the story. Go back to verse 21. Verse 22. It is written, Abraham had two sons. So Paul's saying to these guys, you really love your heritage. You love being, going all the way back to Abram. And Abraham and the promise. And you hang on to that. That's your... That's your, your, you know, your badge of honor, if you will. I just want to point out something to you that you maybe never realized before. Maybe it didn't really hit you. You can go back to Abraham, but did you know Abraham had two sons? Well, we used to sing the song, Abraham had many sons. You know, I'm one of them, so are you. But he had at least two sons. So how do you know which son you're under? You might be taking a lot of pride in going back to Abraham, but... Let me, let me tell you about two sons. Here's how they're different. One had a slave woman as a mother. One had a free woman. One's mother was Hagar, the slave. One's mother was Sarah, the free woman. And they had different status, slave and free. And not only did they have different status, but how they were born is different. One was born by the, the normal way, it says. It was born by the ordinary way, the human way. The other son, Isaac, was born by the normal way, except for in circumstances that were impossible. Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah was 90 years old. 
And it was a result of divine intervention. It was a result of God's promise to him. It was God's covenant to him. That, that's kind of shaking stuff, but it's not anything new. John the Baptist in Matthew, the third chapter, is out baptizing people, you know, John the Baptist, and, and he sees some Pharisees coming down to him in the water to, to be a part of the baptism, and instead of just saying, hey, nice to see you guys, glad you're here for the baptism, he looks at him and he goes, you brood of vipers! And then he just starts letting them have it. And, the, and then they say, well, we're descendants of Abraham. Who are you calling brood of vipers? We're descendants of Abraham. And he goes, you think that's a big deal, it's not. God can raise descendants of Abraham out of stones if he wants to. And all of a sudden, he's, he's saying there's something different between your heritage naturally and a spiritual heritage through faith. Jesus deals with these guys in the same kind of way. If you want to flip over to the eighth chapter of John, there's a, an account where Jesus is, is taking on some of the religious leaders of the day. And in the eighth chapter, starting over in, um, I'm in Luke, that's probably not a good idea. I think it's verse 31. Jesus says, actually to the Jews who had believed in him, verse 31 of John 8, if you hold to my teachings, you really are my disciples. Then you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. And they answered him, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we'll be free? We're already free. We're, do you know who, you know our lineage? It goes all the way back to Abraham. We're born of the free guy, not the slave guy. Jesus replied, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And he goes on about if the sun sets you free, you'll be free. I know you're Abraham's descendants in verse 37, yet you, you're ready to kill me because you've no room for my word. I'm telling you what I've seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you, wouldn't do, then you would do the things Abraham did. And instead you're trying to kill me. You're determined to kill me. And then he gets... Jesus doesn't pull any punches in verse 44. He says, you belong to your father, all right, the devil. Abraham's not your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. He's saying there's a difference between a spiritual legacy through faith, through a promise, and through a flesh legacy. So here's... Here's Ishmael, he's all about flesh, he's all about works, he's all about who you are and what you do and how you do it. Here's Isaac, he's about promise, he's about grace, he's about life, he's about freedom. So which son do you come under when you're, when you're trying to get yourself back to Abraham? Does that make sense so far? Are you with me? Yes. I'll take that as a yes, okay. Then he says, let me just talk to you about these things in a figurative way, verse 24. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she's in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it's written, and he, he quotes Isaiah 54, 1, which we'll look at in just a minute. See if this helps you understand. Some, it helps me at least understand if, um, if I kind of categorize them. So here's Hagar. Here's Sarah. Hagar has Ishmael. Sarah has Isaac. Sarah and Ishmael, or Ishmael and Hagar are slaves. Their lineage is slavery. Sarah and Isaac, free. Hagar had a birth by natural process of Ishmael. Um, 
I don't have to explain that, do I? Do you know what natural pride? Okay. Um, <laughs> Sarah and Isaac are birthed by, by the promise. It's a, it's a God intervention. Hagar and Ishmael in slavery, in this natural process, um, is, is a covenant, the old covenant, which is, is the law. This covenant that Sarah and Isaac are under, I'm not spelling that right, but I'm abbreviating pretend. Um, this covenant is, is the new covenant, and it's, it's a covenant of, of promise. This is Moses, this is Jesus. This is, this is you'll be righteous by keeping the law, this is you'll be righteous because my blood is, is poured out to you. You have your Bibles, you have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Both of them are grace. By grace, God gives us his law. By grace, God gives us his promise. But there's a, there's a difference between the two. And, and Jesus fulfills that, that new law. It, this is also earthly. Jerusalem, this is heavenly Jerusalem, or Jerusalem from above. And then one other thing about this, and this is, this is gonna, this puts a shock on the people that, that read this letter and hear this letter. Judaism is over here, oops, Christianity. It is over here. Okay, let's, let's read again, verse 24. These things may be taken figuratively, for one woman represents two covenants. One covenant from Mount Sinai bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem. What would the present city of Jerusalem, what, what would be figurative about that? versus a new Jerusalem? What would be characteristics of, of the earthly Jerusalem? What's, what's at the center of? Sacrifice. sacrifice. What else? Why is it sacrifice? Why do they do sacrifices there? Okay, they're waiting for the Messiah. So the Jewish people are, have made that their center. They're still, they're still doing Jewish things, right? Rituals, traditions, laws, doing the things that, that keep them in good standing with God. So Paul says, earthly Jerusalem is under Hagar. The old covenant under Hagar. Slavery under Hagar. But the heavenly Jerusalem, that's a different story. That's under Sarah. We're citizens, Paul is talking about, of being of, of the Jerusalem above. You know, when Nicodemus, remember when Nicodemus goes to Jesus in the middle of the night and he's asking questions and, and Jesus basically says, you must be born again. Another translation of being born again is being born from above. You must be born from above. It's a different than the earthly birth. It's not the natural process of birth. It's a heavenly birth. It's, a, it's born from above. It's a different kingdom. It's a, it's, a different, it's a different promise. It's grace. And you'll never see the kingdom from a regular birth. You'll only see a kingdom by being born again. You'll only see the kingdom by being born from above. And here's, here Paul throws in, in verse 27, be glad, O barren woman, as he quotes from Isaiah, who bears no children, break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. And he's quoting back from when they're in the Babylonian captivity. So he's saying, the same way God did a miracle for Sarah, she could not have children. She was barren all her life. Now she's, she's old, 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 old. Her husband is even older and older and older, and they have children. God can take what seems dead 
and bring it to life. We've seen that with Isaac. He's a child of promise. Then he quotes Isaiah from Babylon. The same way that a barren woman gave birth. Let me just tell you, you're in the Babylonian captivity. It looks like Israel has no future. It looks like it's going to be defunct. It looks like it's going to be wiped out from the face of the earth. But God raises up a remnant, and God raises up his people. And back to Israel you go and flourish again. And guess what? I'm going to talk to you in a little minute about his son that comes. And he dies on a cross, and he resurrects again to new life. That's what God is about. That's the God of promise. That's the God of, of our spiritual heritage. He takes dead things and raises them again. And you may be here today, dead. And God can raise you up again. You may spiritually be, be completely shot. In fact, this is what the church is all about because God takes us and raises us to new life. And in that, he's probably pointing back again to that very end of the third chapter when he says, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female for you belong to Christ. And when you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In Christ, remember we talked last week, in Christ, you are the ones that go back to Abraham. And he flips on them what, what from the very get-go Jews have always thought. Hagar is, is slavery. Ishmael is bad. He's, he's all those other, he's all our enemies. He is the father of all of our enemies. But we're of Sarah and Isaac and we're, we're the special people because of our heritage. And Paul goes, uh, rethink that a little bit. Because of what the law has done, it's all natural to you. You really fit under Hagar. What puts us descendants to Abraham is that Abraham believed and it was credited as righteousness. And when we believe and we accept Christ, we become heirs as righteousness. Can, can you imagine what it was like for the Jews to hear this? He, I mean, he upset the apple cart. They're proud of their heritage, and he's saying, yeah, no, you really, you go to Hagar, it's through Christ that we go to Abraham. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Am I on? Okay. Um, I am somewhat confused on Hagar because my understanding has been that she was the, basically where the Islam nation was right. created or born or grown. Right. So I am unclear as far as that relationship to what you just described there on the board. Physi physically, that's true. Physically, she's the, she's the mother of... Every, anybody anybody non-Jew, all the, all the Gentiles, whether Arab or, or whatever. Spiritually, Paul's, Paul's taking it back differently. Spiritually, he's saying it's, it's different because we're related through our belief system. We're related through our, 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 um, our faith in God to, through Jesus. That's how we go back there. And, and we don't believe that we can do this naturally. We can't work our way in. We can't do enough of the laws, we can't keep enough sacrifices, we can, get, we can circumcise everybody in the world, and that doesn't bring them any closer to the spiritual heritage that happens when we get our hearts circumcised, that happens when we realize we can't keep all the law, but that we by grace have to take, take for granted that Jesus paid the sacrifice for us all, that his blood atones us. So it's a, it's a spiritual route that goes differently than the physical. So that they're, they're holding on to physical, and, and Paul's saying, don't put too much trust in physical. Put your trust in the spiritual. So, so the same way that they would have confidence that they're not like those people because the physical, Paul said, it's not, it's not our physical. It's not our, it's not our work. It's not our efforts. It's not natural birth. It's unnatural birth. It's divine intervention. Does that, does that make sense? So he, he's, using, he's using the physical level to help them understand the spiritual level, but then he just throws it upside down because they took so much confidence in their physical level that they couldn't get their mind around the spiritual. And he just, he rattles their cage. Yes, sir. But when the Muslims claim that uh, 
you know, they are sons of Abraham, yeah. and they follow that line. So they're not really wrong. In no, this, no. Even though they don't have Christ. They're absolutely correct. Yeah, they're absolutely correct. In fact, the three world religion, three main world religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all claim Abraham as their, as their father. And you can go back. That's why Jerusalem and Israel is in such a mess, because you got all, everybody converging on, on that area and claiming Abraham as their, as their holy father. Yeah, we all basically go back there. I see hand back, way back. Way to wave like that, that was good. So, I have a question. Uh -huh. At some point, was Sarah, okay, the way that it was explained to me was that Sarah and Abraham were on the Jewish side, and Hagar was on the Arab side, mm -hmm. and that the nations, the sons of these two nations would be at war over, you know, yep. eternal forever. Yep. So, Well, well, for one thing, Sarah, Sarah and Abraham weren't, even, weren't really even Jewish. There were no Jewish people at the time of that covenant that was made. Why God chose Abraham, I don't know. He, I, he, he looked like a likely candidate. Out of Abraham came the Jewish nation. So that nation started with, with Abraham and, and Sarah. Um, what, when he became a Christian, if you will, is when he believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And um, if you go through the book of Genesis in those early chapters, it's pretty interesting to see how many times the Lord shows up, angels show up, and they're talking to Abraham. And some scholars will tell you that in some of those cases, it's a pre-incarnate Christ or a theophany or a Christophany um, that, that, that is, is, is speaking to him so that he never says, I, the law is not even given to them yet. So he, he can't do laws to keep, to be Jewish. He can only take the covenant that this God gave him. And so out of that covenant, God blesses two sons with a lot of different people. And the one, one arm of it is, the, is Jews and the other arm of it is, is Arabs. Or, I mean, well, they weren't Muslim yet because Muhammad didn't come until thousands of years later. So they were Arabs and, and others. And... Um, so that's how, that's how, does that make sense? Am I, is that, is that a hand or are you, you're fixing your hair? Okay. It looks good. Clear as mud. Yeah, here's another hand over here. So uh, what will happen to the Muslim people on this side, on the Ega side, as far as salvation or or when the Christ comes back. Does that mean these people on this side, on the Islamic, would they go to heaven or, <laughs> or not? Um, I'm glad I don't have to make that judgment. <laughs> My whole life is based, and, I, and I, if I'm wrong, I'll find out and I'll, I'll apologize to those that I, my whole life is based on Christ and Christ alone. And it doesn't matter what other label you want to give. I don't care if you give a label of Judaism, Muslim, Christian. There's Christian people that are religious, but they don't have a relationship. I, I, think, I think our eternal life is, is secured through Christ and Christ alone. And I think that's what Paul's talking about the whole way here. Don't trust human ways of getting to God. Everybody's trying to get to God, get to God, get to God. God came to us through Jesus, and he did all the work. We don't have to do, 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 do. Instead, it's been done, 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 done on the cross. And, and our, our righteousness is credited through our belief in him. So I don't, I don't know what he's going to do with everyone else. I do know what he's going to do with us in Christ. And that's, you know, I'm, 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 into, I'm, in, I'm in sales, not into management, you know. So <laughs> I, <laughs> my job is to tell people about Jesus, and um, I'll let God do the management part of that. <laughs> okay, are we ready to move on? Verse 28, now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. That's, uh, now you brothers, talking about the Christians, you're like Isaac, you're children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted 
the son born in the power of the spirit. Those guys, Isaac and Ishmael, kind of went after each other. I want you to see a little correlation in 28 and in, 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 that, in 29. You are children of promise. Talk about the promise to Abraham. Later, he talks about being born, a son born, in verse 29, by the power of the Spirit. So where the power or the, uh, of promise comes, the power of the Spirit starts to take its place because we're going to shift here pretty soon. And instead of just this constant flywheel of grace, 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 he's going to start talking about the Spirit of God and what the Spirit does. And the Spirit comes in where promise comes in, the Spirit comes in. It's the same now, verse 30, but what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. The slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. We read that in, in the 21st chapter of Genesis. Therefore, brothers, we're not children of the slave woman, but we're, we're of the free woman. Talking to the Christians, we're, we're, of, we're not of Hagar, we're of Sarah. And in some versions of the Bible, push up that first verse of chapter 5 as a, kind of a summary of this whole thing. And, uh, and I think it fits well, well there rather than in the paragraph that it's at. The first verse says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Christ has set us free. How do we get free? Christ sets us free. So there's a, there's a little phrase that, that I gave you early on when we, when we met, and I'm going to go back to that. It's Jesus plus. Jesus plus. So Jesus plus, the, the Galatian Judaizers would say Jesus plus what? The law, Jesus plus circumcision, Jesus plus sacrifices, ceremonies, Jesus plus anything. Paul says it's Jesus plus nothing. And in this case, it equals freedom. Or it equals right standing with God. It equals salvation. It equals going to heaven. It equals Jesus plus nothing. So think about this for a minute. When they're talking about circumcision, they're, they're not, he's not referring so much today to the medical procedure of that, but the theological idea of adding to Jesus, whatever that might be. How do we, how do we add to Jesus today in our churches? What have you heard or maybe what do you believe or maybe what someone has told you that it's, if, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to have freedom in Christ, if you're going to be saved, if you're going to make it to heaven, here's what you need. Jesus and Share the word. Did you say, somebody said baptism. I'm talking about what? <laughs> Jesus plus something. You have to be baptized to make, yeah. Or you have to share your faith. Or what else? Works, works. works. What do works mean? What is it? Doing stuff. How many times you go to church? I don't know if any of you are old enough. When I was coming up early in life, there was Sunday morning church. There was Sunday school. Remember Sunday school? There was Sunday morning church. There was Sunday night church. And there was Wednesday night church. Kind of, kind of normal people would go Sunday morning. The Christians came Sunday night. The Green Beret came Wednesday night as well. They came to a prayer meeting. They were the mind of those days. And if you went to all three of those, man, you made it. You were the, you, were the, you, you know. And so the, the idea was, can we get you from Sunday night to also come Sunday, or Sunday morning to also come Sunday night? And then can we get you to come Wednesday night? Because the, the more you're in church, and we get attendance buttons. I had attendance buttons all the way down every which way because the more you go to church, the more, you're, the more you love Jesus. Any others? I can't hear you. Confession? Jesus plus confession? Modeling Christ's behaviors in your own personal life. 
Model Christ, yeah. I mean, the, the list can go, go on and on. We have another one? Yeah. Jesus plus sacraments. Plus the sacraments, yeah, that's a great one. Tongues. Speaking in tongues. I mean, we could, we could go on this list forever and ever and ever. As many, as many people, church people you know, you probably have heard that. Adding on to Jesus, adding on to Jesus. It's Jesus plus, it's Jesus plus, it's Jesus plus. And Paul, Paul starts to lay some stuff out now that he, I mean, we, you thought he got angry in the first chapter? He really gets angry in this one. I mean, he can't stand that idea. And the reason why is here we are now 2,000 years later, and we're doing exactly what the Judaizers did to people. Exactly what they're doing. And he says this, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm. Don't let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Stand firm, and it's because people are always going to pull you away. Stand firm like you're in a tug of war. Dig your heels in and hang on to this. It's Jesus plus nothing. If it's, if it's anything else, that you go back into slavery. So Jesus saves you. He gives you freedom. How, what does he give us freedom from? Freedom from sin, freedom from guilt, freedom from our past, freedom from fear of the law. Am I doing enough? Did I do enough? Did I keep nine out of 10? Did I got to keep 20 out of the 25? I, freedom from death. He gives us all this freedom. And we breathe in, ah, I'm free, I'm forgiven, I'm brand new. And somebody says, well, yeah, but um, are you tithing? Uh, have you come to the mine yet? Are you, you know, are you, have you spoken tongues? Or whatever it might be. And, and Paul says, be careful. Don't let anybody enslave you again. In Paul's mind, I'm convinced of this. Just as bad as being enslaved to sin is being enslaved to self-righteousness, being enslaved to, to religiosity, being confident and prideful that you got it together because of what you are doing. He says it's like this. If somebody came and freed you from, from prison, you're in a prison cell, you're all locked up. Somebody comes and says, hey, bail's been paid or whatever, and unlocks the door and you walk out and you, you go and there's sunshine and there's beauty and oh, I'm just breathing in the, <clears throat> excuse me, the fresh air. <clears throat> fresh air chokes me up. <laughs> and they're like, oh man, what am I gonna do? Let me clear my throat. Don't listen. <clears throat> there, there, Not, didn't help either. But. Um, and then you're walking down in freedom and you, you know that you can go on and go free, but instead you see an open cell with a door open, and that person walks into the open cell and shuts the cell and says, I'm going to stay in here. I like it in here better. And Paul's going, don't you know you were set free in order to be free? What are you doing trying to go back? You can throw it. I'll catch it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Jesus plus water. <laughs> the living water. Don't be burdened again by that. And they says this. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, again, not, it's, it's not the, the act of circumcision that's a big deal. It's a theological idea. If you let yourself be, have anything added to Jesus, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Wow. It's like, if you start adding to what Christ is, you're saying his work was not enough. And when you start shrinking Jesus and thinking you need to add something on, he becomes no value at all. If you can work your way into heaven, work your way into heaven. Do enough good things. Good luck with that. You'll be the first one. But you, you scratch him out if, if, if that's the case. Because Jesus plus nothing, or, or Jesus plus something, 
equals, equals nothing is basically what he's saying. Yes, sir. So the, the reason that, that Jesus was sent in the first place was because we weren't good enough to, to fulfill those laws. It's, right. not, it's not that that they were saying that these laws are are not a good thing to follow. It's uh, us as humans can't ever fulfill that, which is right. why Jesus was sent in the first place. Exactly. So what Paul is just trying to, to reiterate then is is because of of our shortcomings, there's nothing else that we can do. And so so I, I really appreciate how you described that because it, it actually has opened up my mind to to accept those exact words, uh, just how you described them, that it's Jesus plus nothing. So I yeah. just wanted to say that. Great. If it, if, if it was, if it was um, the, the laws, it, if the laws could do it, there's nothing wrong with the laws. We just can't keep them. We'd have to do it perfect. Jesus says, be perfect because my Father is in heaven. Nobody's, they just fall short for salvation. So all our good works, wonderful to do good works, do good works, keep the law, but the law is only to show us that we need a Savior and leads us to the Savior. Otherwise, if it's Jesus plus something, you, you, you shrink Jesus down. Um, keep going, verse three. Again, I declare to every, excuse me, again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he's obligated to obey the whole law. So if it's Jesus plus something, then it's not just Jesus plus something, it's Jesus plus everything. If you start on that, if you start on that road of I'm gonna keep the law, it's not, you don't get to pick and choose. I, I like four laws, I'm gonna do those, and that's gonna get me, no, you're obligated then to keep them all. You, you can't say I'm gonna be a, a citizen of the United States but I'm only gonna keep about five laws and the rest of them you got. No, if you're a citizen of the United States, you're gonna be held accountable to all laws. I mean, look at the 10 commandments. Okay, I can, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna murder anybody. I'll, I'll, I'll keep that one. Um, stealing, I, I'll be all right with not stealing. And Sabbath, I'll go to church. I'll keep those three. No, you're gonna to have to keep all of them. Go ahead. Hello. Oh, I'm much like this gentleman here. I kind of wrestled with this a while too. And one of the verses that really um, stuck with me was Romans 10 9. When it basically it's one statement. He says, if you confess openly with your mouth that Jesus uh, Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the next sentence, you will be saved. Yeah. Right? And it's funny how sometimes in the Bible, there's simple statements that I, sometimes we, we tend to either over-engineering or over, overthink these things, but that's God's word. It's pretty simple. Pretty simple. Right? Not easy, but Not simple. Easy. Yeah, yeah. You okay still? Yes. Verse four, you're trying to be justified by law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. So you're trying, to, you're trying to be justified by keeping the law that alienates you from Christ because you realize, I'm sinful. I can't keep this law. I can't keep that standard. But when you're trying to do that, he uses the phrase that we use in the wrong context all the time. You have fallen from grace. How do we use that phrase? You have fallen from grace. You disappoint, you disappoint somebody. You sin. You backslide. You, you were there, and you fell. Um, if you're old enough, you remember <clears throat> a preacher named Jimmy Swagger. Remember Jimmy Swagger? And he messed up, got caught with a prostitute or something. I don't remember the whole thing. But I think it was Time. It was either Time or Newsweek magazine on the front cover had him with his tears and all that kind of stuff, and it said, fallen from grace, big old headlines. And everybody knew what he, he'd messed up big time and you know, brought reproach upon himself and the church and ministry and all that kind of stuff. That's how we usually use fallen from grace. 
Paul's not using that term that way. He's not saying it's because you were, you were sinning and you fell off the cliff. You were here and you fell off. He's saying when you add on to, to Jesus, when you add on to his work, when you add on to trust in him that he's sufficient, that he's done enough, that he's done everything, that he's paid the price, that he's, he's your robe of cleanliness, he's your robe of righteousness. When you add on to that, you are, you are tearing away at grace and you fall from grace. You've had it when you accepted him. A lot of us accept Jesus by grace and then we say, okay, Jesus, I'll take it from here. And we trust in our works again. And Paul's saying, don't fall back into that. Don't do it. Don't fall from the grace that you're at. And he's going to introduce us in a little bit to a pretty good substitute for the law it's called the Spirit of God and this thing called love. So we'll start to pick that up next week um, in that fifth chapter. Any last thoughts or questions before we, uh, we close? One thought I had, uh, and not in judgment, the Mormon people uh, seem to be trying to do works in order to yeah. get into heaven. And uh, they are wonderful people, and they right. really are very helpful to one another and so forth. Right. But I see a lot of that is that they are, you know, they must fulfill almost an obligation to the church yep. and their Mormon community. Yep. Otherwise, they're not going to. Every, okay. every religion basically is works-related religion. Christ is the only one that, that does the work for us, and it's through faith, and it's through grace. Every, every, you, ever, you name every other religion. It's what can I do for God to help God like me? What can I do for God to get up to God? What can I do for God? And... And, and Christ is the only one that says, I've, I've done it for you. Would you just, just trust me? Just, just throw your life into my, into my hands and let's, let's go from there. So, All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, <laughs> I, th I think Paul kind of rattled our cage a little bit today. I think he kind of enjoyed rattling the cage of, of those Galatian people who were... Who were finding themselves trusting in, in their own works more than they were in Jesus. Thank you that he stands up. Thank you that he stood firm. Thank you that he dug his heels in. And it's grace alone, it's faith alone, it's Jesus alone, it's Jesus plus nothing. Lord, I pray that you would just fill us up with more Jesus, that you would, that you would see our hearts becoming bigger and welcoming you in, that, you would, that Jesus would overflow in us that you would, you would allow us to fall so in love with Jesus that, that our concern is just to draw closer to you as you draw closer to us. And that Jesus starts to just live his life through us. That we become known as little, little, little Christ-like people, little Christians, followers of Jesus. Thank you that you would love us so much to die on a cross. It's hard to get our mind around that you love us, that you even know who we are. You love us that much. So Jesus, tonight, we proclaim again, we love you. We will serve you. We will follow you until you come again. Find us faithfully at the task of, of being more loving to you, our God, and more loving to the neighbors that you bring to our midst. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.